feels a bit like a speed dating event. Like, uh, I feel like I should say, well, I'm Ben Curry, I like ponies, uh, frolicking in the countryside, um, karaoke, and um, cinema. I have a sense of humor. Um, so, um, I'm from VMware. Uh, Spring Source is the logo on my slides. Uh, Spring Source was acquired by VMware about a year and a half ago, and I was part of that acquisition. And uh, I was a little nervous coming here. Um, the VMware recruiter actually called me up this afternoon and said, uh, oh, Ben, you know, I hear you're doing some SF Jug thing this afternoon. Could you possibly plug VMware? And, like, it's a cool place to work. I'm like, well, it's kind of, you know, developers and, you know. But given that everyone else has done it, um, I, you know, VMware is a great place to work. There you go. I did it. Um, <laughs> come work for us. We're recruiting. So Spring Source uh, was acquired by VMware about 18 months ago. Uh, I was part of that Spring Source acquisition. It's part of my introduction here. Um, and I've basically spent my whole career in Java. Uh, I left university in 98, went and worked for IBM when Java was, you know, kind of just starting out. It sounded like a really cool thing to do. Um, started off testing Java 114, then got into JVM development at IBM. Uh, I basically uh, took the J9 JVM from being a micro edition to a standard edition JVM. Then I developed uh, a class sharing capability in that JVM over about five years. Um, I won't go into any detail on that, but it was, it was pretty cool. It was a really good grounding in, in, in sort of uh, JVM development and that whole area. Then I moved to Spring Source because I wanted a change. I wanted to get out, uh, do something different, uh, learn about stuff higher up the stack. So I spent 18 months basically touring Europe and various places teaching Spring Framework and teaching OSGI and teaching you know, Tomcat and Java and all this kind of stuff. Um, and then VMware acquired Spring Source and they were like, well, we've got this big Java stack and we know that there's still some areas in which we really want to improve Java. And so they gave me the opportunity to come over here and basically just kind of start some really small projects looking at how we can make Java perform better uh, in a virtualized environment. So I spent the last 18 months uh, doing exactly that, basically just spending the whole time looking at uh, you know, where, where is the work that we still need to do? What are the things that customers are still complaining about? Right? And one of the things I will be talking to you about uh, in this presentation uh, is uh, the product I've been working on for the last year because it's cool. You know, I'm, I'm really proud of what we've done. Uh, I'll be giving you a sneak peek of what we are going to be doing as well, which you know, hopefully uh, will work. I've got a very complex demo. Uh, and the last time I gave this presentation, the demo very embarrassingly just didn't work at all because the network went down. So I'm hoping we'll get the demo working. If we do, uh, it should be a really good illustration of the kind of things I'm talking about. So that's enough of an introduction. Um, so what I really want to do in this presentation is um, go in depth looking primarily at memory management for Java when running virtual. Now, um, I'm going to go into some background on just kind of the whole layers of memory management uh, in the hypervisor uh, and the operating system. Uh, I'll be going into some detail about different types of memory management in Java, and then ultimately tying all those things together and looking at how they interact. Um, what I really want to examine are some of the performance pitfalls that you can end up hitting uh, and ultimately what we've done to, to, to help address that. By the way, do Shout out questions, uh, observations, abuse as we go. Um, uh, well, there'll be Q and A at the end, but you know I, I will try and uh, try and deal with questions as they arise. And I'm sorry that this is a little bit dim. During the demo, I will be zooming in and stuff so you can see a bit better. So um, I've just got a few kind of what is virtualization slides. Hopefully, most people are familiar with this. Um, it's really uh, about taking uh, what were physical machines and essentially creating a mechanism of uh, virtualizing them, making virtual machines out of your physical machines, putting them all onto uh, a larger piece of hardware to give you these benefits. So um, you know, we're running multiple operating systems on one machine. Uh, we can get high availability. Uh, you know, we, uh, we can monitor things a whole lot better. Um, you know, they're more configurable. So really, we're looking at taking a whole bunch of physical machines and consolidating them down into much more manageable uh, and configurable systems. And of course, once you've done that, uh, you know, you can then take advantage of high availability stuff uh, and some of the other cool things that uh, virtualization is able to do. Well, one of the things that is worth mentioning about virtualization, though, is it allows you to um, treat 
uh, resources in arbitrary ways, right? So you can basically create pools of resources, whether that's CPU, whether that's memory, and you can put VMs into those pools of resources and create arbitrary constraints around memory and CPU to divide up the computing resource that you have available to you. The reason I mention this is because we'll be referring to that a little bit later on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off looking at the existing Java best practices that we have. Now, um, it's really interesting, actually. The guy that wrote our best practices guide, um, uh, he's spent quite a lot of time uh, working with companies that have been virtualizing Java. In fact, he's been doing it for years. And he's really sort of gone through this whole process of, of, of experiencing problems that customers have had, coming up with solutions, finding uh, a lot of the commonly experienced problems. And at VMworld every year, he gives a talk on Java best practices. It's a whole hour-long talk in itself. Um, he's written a paper that I've referenced online. But every single year, it seems like there's exponential growth in the people that are virtualizing Java. Yeah, every year, it just doubles in size. And at the start, there's always a show of hands. It's like, yeah, we're virtualizing Java, or we have, or we're in the middle of it. Um, and there's a lot of interest at this point in, OK, how do we do it without tripping up on the kind of common problems? So the first thing I want to look at is you know, some of those, uh, just a summary of some of those things before we start looking in depth at memory. It's worth mentioning that actually hardware does have a part to play uh, in how effectively virtualization um, performs. Um, there's various different uh, CPU uh, enhancements, capabilities that appeared uh, from sort of 2006. And the more recent CPUs, particularly the ones that have the MMU virtualization, um, give you much better performance uh, with virtualization. So that's definitely something to, just to bear in mind. We do have some really good papers, though, online. We have uh, a best practices. So this is a general best practice virtualization uh, paper for um, just running anything on vSphere. But we also have a specific enterprise Java applications best practice guide. Um, and as I say, that is uh, all the expertise of this colleague of mine boiled down into a paper. Um, it's really worth reading if you're virtualizing Java or considering virtualizing Java. So let's think about, before we uh, go into depth in, in terms of memory, some of just the, 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 the things I've pulled out of that paper. So with memory, one of the first uh, sort of and, and most important sort of underlined best practices that we've had for a long time is always give Java 100% of the memory that it needs, right? Don't overcommit Java, right? And the reason we don't overcommit Java is one of the things I'm going to explore later on in this presentation. But really, it's because Java uh, is a special case, right? We're going to explore why that is later. But it's like, don't even think about it, because there's potential pitfalls. Second thing, try to reduce the Java heap if possible to avoid wasting memory. Well, that's, that's not a good message. Because you know, we set our Java heaps to be a particular size for a good reason. We don't want to go out of memory. You know, we want uh, the garbage collection performance that we desire. Um, so you know, that's not a good message either. Right? Using large pages, again, we'll look at a little bit later. That does help with performance. Um, but as I say, we're focusing mainly on memory in this presentation, so we'll move on from that. Now, there's a whole bunch of best practice advice about the number of CPUs. Because with virtualization, of course, you can select how many vCPUs you want. And sometimes it's difficult to figure out, you know, should I just give it like 16 and that'll just make it perform better, or should I give it two? You know, it's actually quite a difficult question. Um, generally, the best practice that we have is, you know, more is not necessarily better, right? Typically, try to match the number of CPUs to the number of garbage collection threads that you have. Uh, and you can set that on the command line, you know, you can configure that yourself. Um, and in fact, the JVM will, should auto-tune the number of garbage collection threads to the number of CPUs you have as well. Um, but that's the main bit of advice around CPUs. And there's a bunch more in, in the paper, and I recommend you go and look at that in more detail. The timekeeping is an interesting one, too. It's not one that you would necessarily uh, think about. But actually, um, you know, with virtualization, you can get into situations where you have very fractional um, sort, of, sort of errors in terms of, in terms of extremely precise timekeeping. And so there are particular distributions of uh, Linux and Windows. And I've actually got an appendix in the back of this presentation. And I'll show you the appendix at the end. Um, there's, there's various things that we recommend to make sure that you don't run into those problems, because they are kind of subtle. Uh, you won't necessarily spot them immediately. 
And then there's a whole bunch of stuff in the paper as well. Experience gained from uh, scalability in terms of, you know, how do we scale vertically, how do we scale horizontally. Um, so I do recommend, if you, if you are virtualizing Java, if you have vir virtualized it, go read the paper because it, it's, it's got a lot of good stuff in it. Okay, so that's kind of just a very, very high-level overview of some of the things you need to think about when virtualizing Java. But as I say, I'm going to focus on memory. Now, the main reason I'm going to focus on memory is because memory is the one area that's still not great, right? The best practice advice that we just saw, which is try and reduce your heap size, don't overcommit memory, it's not a great message, right? And we've been giving this message year, year after year, and this is why VMware brought me in to try to see if I could do something about this. So this is why we're going to be focusing on memory. And what I want to do is actually go through um, a, sort of a whole sort of series of slides explaining how the various layers interact, because that will give good background in explaining why Java uh, responds in the way that it does. So when we think about uh, virtual memory, see we have virtual memory here. Um, we're thinking typically about the application space. And the operating system, you can allocate virtual memory. Uh, the operating system ultimately maps that to physical memory. But then if you introduce virtualization, you actually introduce another level of indirection. So if you write some virtual, or you write some memory at this level, it gets stored in a memory address at that level, and then gets mapped to a memory address actually on the host that your VM is living in. So really, we can think about you know, memory being written to one place, it's stored uh, in another address here, and kind of stored actually on the physical memory, which we call machine memory on the host, confusingly. Physical memory here is what we <laughs> describe as the memory in the operating system, which of course when it's virtualized is one level of indirection above the actual real physical memory. So when we think about what lives at these levels, we've got the application at the top here, the operating system, and the hypervisor. So when we think about a virtual machine, and by the way, in this presentation, those of you who say VM when you mean JVM, I won't be confusing the two, right? When I, when I mean JVM, I'll say JVM. When I mean VM, I'll say VM. We have so much confusion about that at work. Um, so a VM encapsulates those two layers, the application layer and the sort of base operating system layer. So let's think about application memory management. Typically, an application is going to allocate some memory when it needs it. Uh, it's going to do some work. And then when it's done with that memory, a well-behaved application is going to free it, right? It's going to free it back, back to the operating system. Then when we think about how the operating system uh, manages memory, of course, its responsibility is to juggle the memory needs of the applications that are running on it. Okay, so it has a free list. Uh, it basically uh, doles out memory. It might swap memory to disk. But its job is to manage the memory that the applications need. And as I say, it defines the semantics of what allocated memory and what free memory actually is. And all of that uh, information exists at that operating system layer. So, when the operating system wants to actually write some memory, the hypervisor gives it a memory address, and the memory is written into the hypervisor, and that continues and continues ad infinitum. So the hypervisor is actually the thing that owns the memory that's being written to, and it's managing this level of indirection between the operating system and itself. Now, the fact that there's a level of indirection here actually allows it to do some pretty cool tricks that we're going to look at a little bit later on. Um, but the important thing to understand here is machine memory is lazily allocated as it's needed, okay? which, which makes sense. You know, there's no reason you would allocate all the memory the operating system needs up front. So what happens then if uh, the operating system actually wants to free memory, uh, or the application wants to free memory back to the operating system? Well, let's say the application just here has just freed that gray bit of memory. okay? It's free the memory, so that memory now appears in the free list. However, the hypervisor has no idea that that's just happened. It's still maintaining the state of that memory. Because of these levels of indirection, it just has no idea. And actually, there's quite an important separation of concerns there that means that it really shouldn't know what applications own what memory and at what time, right? So the memory's been freed, but the hypervisor isn't aware that that's happened. So if we actually play this scenario out, Let's say an application starts up. So the application starts up, it writes some memory, which means the memory's come off the free list, and it's been written into the machine memory on the hypervisor. Let's say it writes some more memory, and the same thing's happened again. Now let's say it frees that memory back. So the memory's gone back on the free list in the operating system, but the hypervisor is still maintaining 
the state of that memory. Now it's allocated some more, uh, and now it's freed that memory. But you can see how the memory becomes basically garbage memory in the operating system, but isn't garbage memory in the hypervisor. The, 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 the state of it is still maintained. So what actually uh, happens here, if we think about the VM as a black box, what actually happens is that you just see from the hypervisor's perspective that memory is just being written to and written to and written to and written to and written to. There's, there's no way the hypervisor has of actually determining what memory uh, it can actually reclaim from that VM. Again, because of this separation of concerns that exists. So, so over the years, various different uh, mechanisms have been developed to try to reclaim memory from VMs. We're going to look at some of these mechanisms in the next slide. Uh, we can kind of divide these mechanisms into um, proactive mechanisms and reactive mechanisms, right? A proactive mechanism is one that's kind of, you know, very low priority. Over time, it's going to try and reclaim some memory if it can. A reactive one is like, I need memory. Give me memory, right? So the transparent page sharing is an example of a, a proactive feature, right? So there's a, a background thread that just trawls around kind of slowly and just looks to see if there's any identical pages at this level in the hypervisor. Now remember I told you that level of indirection between the VMs and the hypervisor allows for some cool tricks. So what it's actually able to do is it's actually able to point identical pages at the same machine page. And then if any, any of these pages are actually written to, behind the scenes, there's a copy on write. It gets its own copy of the memory. And ultimately, what we've done there, of course, as you can see, is we've saved some memory by sharing, uh, sharing memory. Now, most of the memory that we share is going to be immutable. Um, and it's you know, going to sit there for a while and eventually find this immutable memory and share it. But that's quite a useful feature. There's no point duplicating it. Now, if the hypervisor actually quite urgently needs memory, right? then a reactive technique that it can use is a technique called ballooning. And what I'm going to do is explain a little bit about what ballooning is for those of you who haven't seen it before. Let's say we have a couple of VMs, and they're all using uh, memory on the hypervisor. Well, ballooning is basically a way that the hypervisor has of putting direct pressure on the operating system to force it to give back memory. Okay? Now, well, I'm going to show you exactly how that works in this next slide. Let's imagine that the hypervisor down here has eight pieces of memory that have been written to. Okay? It says machine memory that's been written to. But you can see this guest app here actually only has three bits of memory that it's using. This means that there must have been things running beforehand that's left a whole bunch of dirty memory here in the operating system, and that's then still allocated in the hypervisor. So the hypervisor is basically saying, I need some of this memory back right, from the operating system. And you can see there's actually plenty of free memory there. So it has this thing called a balloon driver. And the job of the balloon driver is to take instructions from the hypervisor and allocate memory. So let me show you. Let's say the hypervisor says, right, I need three bits of memory. Well, the balloon driver allocates the memory, and it now owns that memory in the operating system. So the memory has gone off the free list. The balloon driver then pins the uh, memory to make sure that it can't be swapped to disk and it can't move. What it then does is it then passes a message back to the hypervisor saying, OK, I now own this memory, and I've pinned it, so it's not going anywhere. Here are the addresses of that memory. You can have it back. So it's like a kind of a, a sort of, the balloon driver is like a secret agent with a red telephone working on behalf of the hypervisor undercover inside the VM. It makes it sound more exciting than it is, but you know, it's, it's a nice image. So, so what's, what's happened there, importantly, is the hypervisor's been then able to decouple that memory. And of course, now, instead of having eight pieces of memory, we now have five pieces of memory allocated. And ballooning, the first time you come across it, is actually a little bit counterintuitive. Because what we're doing is we're actually allocating memory in order to give it back. So one possible side effect of this ballooning is that uh, potentially, there's not actually going to be uh, enough memory uh, for the balloon driver to, 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 to take without causing any uh, side effects to that operating system. All right? So let's imagine there's loads of free memory. Um, the balloon driver takes the memory and everything's good. But if there really isn't much free memory in that uh, operating system, 
and the balloon driver takes a bunch of it, there's a potential that it's going to um, eat into the buffer cache, which maybe is what we want. But there's also a potential it might start paging other applications to disk. Um, yeah. The question was uh, whether the operating system is aware that this is going on. And the answer is yes, it is, um, because the balloon driver is just a process that runs in there, and it simply just allocates and pins memory. And then if the hypervisor wants the balloon to shrink, it just frees the memory they're allocated and tells the hypervisor that's happened. So the operating system is very well aware that that's happening. And in a sense, that's kind of the point. Because what we're trying to do here is we're trying to make the operating system do the right thing within its own framework of memory management. Right? We're putting pressure on it. And if it decides, OK, I'm going to give up some buffer cache, or if it decides I'm going to swap this application to disk, or even if it decides I'm going to kill this application because I'm completely out of memory, that's the right thing for it to do because we're, we're, we're not telling it what to do. We're just kind of having, you know, we're, we're, we're putting memory pressure on there, if that makes sense. So, so let's look at a couple more techniques the hypervisor has available to it very quickly. Um, again, these are reactive, right? So if ballooning doesn't give us enough memory, um, we really don't want any VM uh, violating any constraints or using more memory than it should. Uh, and so the, the hypervisor will come down pretty hard on a VM that doesn't behave. And one of the ways it can do that is uh, by compressing memory. So here you see this piece of blue memory here. What it can do is that it can actually zip it and then uh, sort of have a, a sort of pseudo reference to it. And then it will uncompress it if it needs to be read back in again. So it's like swapping, but it allows the hypervisor to keep it in memory. And so it's more performant than swapping to disk. But of course, at the last resort, it can actually swap memory out to disk. Again, it's a way to free memory, but it's not going to be performant. So a really important question that, that's raised by this whole topic of memory reclamation is, when does the hypervisor reclaim memory, and which VMs does it target for this kind of reclamation? Well, the answer to when it reclaims memory is simply if it's under memory pressure. Right? So the passive technique that we saw happens all the time regardless. It's very, very low cost. It doesn't, you know, there's no real, no real notice. No one really notices that that's happening. Whereas the reactive techniques are only employed if uh, there is memory pressure on the host. So remember earlier on we talked about how you can create these resource pools. So let's say, for example, that I've got two VMs that are uh, four gigabytes each. So I have eight gigabytes of, of VRAM in total. And I put those into a resource pool that I say, OK, I only want you to have six gigabytes. We've basically then applied some memory pressure by saying these guys can only consume a maximum of six gigabytes on the host. And it's at that point the hypervisor is going to have to start basically putting memory pressure on these guys and really doing a juggling act under the covers to make sure that uh, they only ever consume that six gigabytes. So that's when reclamation occurs. Uh, which VMs is actually another interesting question, because you don't want to be reclaiming memory from VMs that are very uh, active or they have you know, a lot of memory in use. And so what the hypervisor does is it, is it makes a pretty accurate estimation of the amount of active memory in a VM. So it will look at the number of reads and writes going on uh, with any given VM. It will estimate how much of that memory is actually active, how much of it is in use. And it will target the least active uh, VMs for reclamation. And actually, um, this is exactly what you want. You know, you may have um, two VMs, uh, one of which is serving one geography, and the other of which is serving an another geography that's 12 hours, uh, you know, advanced. And so for part of the day, one's going to be really active. For the other part of the day, the other one's going to be really active. And again, that, that's a perfect candidate for that kind of resource juggling. You know, you'll get memory reclamation from the least active one when it's most appropriate, and the most active one gets all the memory that it needs. So that's basically the tricks that are used under the covers to make sure that, in general, it makes the right choices and the right decisions. I will say, though, that for things that are very highly performant, like anything that is, you know, latencies are critical, um, you know, any kind of memory over commitment, regardless of whether it's Java, is probably not going to be appropriate, right? Because, because there's always going to be uh, a small cost incurred, regardless of you know, regardless of how, how big or small that actually ends up being. So, having looked then at these memory reclamation techniques, yeah, hi. So if you don't use a resource pool, do you still have the same? Yeah, so if you weren't to use a resource pool, there's a couple of different ways that memory pressure could occur. 
you could actually have the entire host be overcommitted, for example. So if you've got you know, 32 gig in the host and you have enough VMs that total 48 gig, that's one way in which it will try and reclaim memory. Um, you can also force VMs into situations where they have to run in less memory than, you've given, than, than they think they have. Um, that's less, a, less of a good idea because you basically bypass the hypervisor's sort of uh, intelligent estimation at that point. But, um, but there are various different ways of making that happen, yeah. And of course, you know, this integrates quite nicely with uh, the vMotion technology as well. So if one host gets under too much memory pressure, it'll start moving VMs off onto another host you know, that, that you might have as a backup. So you know, the, the, it works in, in, in an integrated way with that. So what I want to look at now is um, Java memory management, um, and then we'll sort of hook the two together. Now, what's interesting when we look at Java is that there are actually some quite interesting parallels between the black box relationship that we saw between VMs and the hypervisor and the relationship between a JVM and the operating system. Okay? So let's look at what happens when a JVM starts up. So the JVM starts up. Let's say the JIT initializes, the interpreter initializes, the garbage collection initializes, and then your application starts. So your application is going to start writing data into the heap, and it's going to be, of course, chewing into the uh, memory in the operating system. So we'll fill up the heat, uh, heap as we're allocating objects. And eventually, there's going to be a garbage collection. So the garbage collection occurs. And now, that's great. We've got some free memory. Right? But the thing is, the free memory is only available to the JVM. That, that memory is now no longer available to any other process in that operating system. Okay? So the operating system has no way of reclaiming that memory in exactly the same way as the hypervisor had no way of reclaiming the memory from the operating system, right? It's exactly the same kind of relationship. So let's just play out some scenarios then and look at what, what differences different heap configurations could make. Because this is actually quite interesting. There's, uh, quite often um, uh, you get the question about, is it better for me to have XMS and XMX set to the same thing? Or is it best to have XMS set smaller than XMX? Well, you know, it, it actually really depends largely on the kind of application you have. Typically, when I was at IBM, we would tell customers never set XMS equal to XMX. Because if you have a non-generational heap, you basically work, 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 oh, massive garbage collection. <laughs> you know? And that's not necessarily what you want. Um, but let's have a look. Let's play out a, a scenario and compare the behavior of a partially committed heap with a fully committed heap. So with a partially committed heap here, the initial size is smaller than the maximum size. And let's allocate some objects. So we allocate an object, allocate another object. Oh, the heap's full, right? So we're going to have a garbage collection. So we've had a garbage collection, and we've collected half of our data in the heap. So the next object is actually going to overwrite this memory here, which is, which is good. So then we've reached the maximum size of the heap again. And this is what the JVM will do, if, if well, the Sun, Sun JVM anyway is that when it gets to a point where the heap is full, it will do a garbage collection, and it will increase the size. So this is what it's done. Again, we're going to overwrite the garbage that was there before. And eventually, we will get to a point where we've done our final garbage collection. And this is the amount of memory we're now consuming as our footprint in the virtual machine. Sorry, I should say in the guest operating system. Now let's play this out again with a fully committed heap. When we set XMX, XMS, equal to XMX. So as you can imagine, we're just going to basically, now at this point, remember that yellow thing has become garbage. Oh, and now the blue thing has become garbage. But because we've had no garbage collection, of course, you know, that's, that's not really been registered yet. So eventually, we will get a full garbage collection. The consequence of this heap configuration, uh, well, there's two interesting consequences here. One is that the footprint of this JVM is now bigger on the operating system. And the way that the hotspot JVM works is that it's very, very reluctant to shrink its heap. You can force it to shrink its heap, but generally it's very reluctant to because it kind of assumes, okay, I've got you know, all this memory, I can just kind of use it, it's fine. Now, there are other JVMs that will shrink their heaps very aggressively. Uh, Azul's JVM, for example, will do that, uh, and so that's going to be quite different behavior. But certainly with hotspot, this is what you get. Now, the other interesting thing here is that it's left more fragmentation in the heap, which is ultimately going to have to be uh, sorted out. Now, I'm not saying that, it, that this is always better, but it's interesting to see the consequence of just that different heap configuration has had. And to a certain extent, 
it's a uh, side effect of the amount of live data you have at any one time, right, is, is, is how this is ultimately going to behave. So in a, in, a, in a few minutes, we're going to tie those two things together. Firstly, though, I want to mention large pages, because I talked about that briefly earlier on. We do um, recommend, in our best practice guide, that you use large pages when you use Java. Um, a lot of people don't. In fact, most people don't bother to use large pages, partly because it can be kind of a pain to configure. Uh, and if any of you have used uh, Linux and Java, I mean, it's just, you know, you go round and round and round trying to figure out exactly, you know, which, exactly how to make it work, because the, the error messages really aren't all that helpful if you get it wrong. Um, but it does actually make quite a, a big performance difference. We have uh, put some papers out on that uh, that you can search for. Um, but the reason that it performs better is because there's much less uh, indirection that needs to be managed, or the indirection is at a different granularity. So it's much, much easier for the hypervisor to, to, to handle those large pages than it is for smaller pages. So let's tie these things together and look at how the JVM and the hypervisor interact when it comes to memory management. So just to recap what we've talked about, we've seen that the VM is a black box to the hypervisor. We've seen that the JVM is a black box to the guest, the guest operating system. We've seen that the most efficient way of reclaiming memory is ballooning, right? But ballooning basically forces the operating system to, to give memory back to the hypervisor. Now, given that when you're running Java, the operating system has no way of actually getting memory back from the JVM, we're actually applying the memory pressure at the wrong place, right? And, and, and that can have interesting consequences, right? So Java's memory management basically breaks this model, at least with, with the hotspot JVM. And this is why we recommend that you don't overcommit memory with Java. And I'm actually going to do some demos that will show you exactly what happens if you do that uh, in a second. So with ballooning, the hypervisor, uh, yeah, so I've already mentioned that. That's fine. So, so let's have a look at what happens with Java. Let's actually play this out. What we're going to do is we're going to run the exact same scenario that we just did. In fact, this is the situation that we left that previous scenario in, and we're going to apply ballooning to that. So let's introduce the balloon. And then let's say that the hypervisor says, OK, give me some memory. So the balloon uh, inflates. Fortunately, there's actually some free memory in that operating system. And so that's all been fine. And then you know, the heap's written some more memory, and everything's hunky-dory. With a fully committed heap, though, remember we left it in this slightly uh, fragmented and you know, um, bigger footprint state. We introduced the balloon. Suddenly, the balloon is fighting with the JVM for memory. So what it's likely to do is it's likely to swap the JVM heap out to disk because it can't get access to that, to that free memory. And what's going to happen? Well, the next time a garbage collection occurs, it's going to be very slow because it's going, you're going to have very high latencies trying to page all that heap memory back in from disk. Okay? So what's interesting about this is that the only difference between these two scenarios is how we configured our heap, right? which is a really subtle thing. Um, but it's because of these subtleties that, again, we say, you know what? The provisors are too complex. Don't do it. Okay? Um, now, what's interesting, actually, is that the behavior of this ballooning varies with uh, large and small pages. Now, those of you who've used large pages on Linux will know that the current implementation, uh, actually, uh, the large pages are pinned. They can't be swapped to disk. Um, and so, what happens is if you back the entire JVM with large pages, and that's the majority of the memory uh, in, the, in, the, in the VM, the balloon won't swap memory to disk because it can't, because it can't swap those large pages to disk. So actually, it simply won't inflate, and the hypervisor will start host swapping it instead. It'll start trying to compress it and host swap it, and the performance will suck just as badly. So um, it sucks in a different way, but it will still suck. And again, we will show you, uh, show you that happening. Again, I want to stress <laughs> just in case, you know, this actually gets me fired, that I'm not saying that VMware's performance sucks, okay? <laughs> we just want to be clear about this, right? What I'm saying is that the Java memory model is incompatible with the ballooning, and that's why we end up in this. So it's Java's fault. That's what I want to say. It's Java's fault. <laughs> so well, what about the transparent page sharing? Well, um, given that most of JVM is, is, is rapidly changing memory, most of it's not immutable, um, really, that's, that doesn't help a whole lot. So, 
Just to, uh, well, we talked about what memory over commitment is already, so I'm going to skip past this page. What I'm actually going to do now is um, just kick off this demo, um, just to kind of break the presentation up a little bit, because it'll take a little while to run, and we'll come back to it afterwards, uh, and hopefully um, it will all make sense. Now, the last time I gave this demo was uh, at Spring One, and uh, InfoQ were filming it. And it went so wrong, and it was so embarrassing, and I didn't swear. I did very well, did not to swear. Um, but they posted it on InfoQ, and it's really embarrassing. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to uh, log into some VMs that I've got running here. Now, there's quite a few of them. This is why this is a fragile demo. If this thing shifts up slightly, it means it's still running. There we go. So what I've got is I've got um, 12. VMs in total running here, all running Linux. And if I log into here, I have a Windows machine uh, that I'm monitoring them all on. Uh, I can also start a J console so that I can monitor uh, all of the Tomcat servers that are running in these virtual machines. Here we go. Now, for those of you at the back, I am going to zoom, zoom into pertinent information because I, I, I understand it's going to be a little bit small. So. Um, so I'm just going to start JConsole on these uh, this Tomcat servers running in all these VMs. And what I'm now going to do is talk about what is actually in these VMs, right? So each VM uh, is 1.4 gig and is running a JVM with a 1 gigabyte heap. Now, the JVM is running Tomcat. And in Tomcat is um, a JMS message server micro benchmark that we have for exactly this kind of testing. Now, the reason we have this JMS test is because a message queue is actually a really great way of uh, managing how much live data you have. You know, the size of your message queue basically is the amount of live data you'll have at any one time. You have a sender sending messages to the queue. You have the receiver receiving messages from the queue. Uh, you can control the throughput. You can control all sorts of memory profiles to get sort of uh, effects that you want. So that's what we're running uh, in these Tomcat servers. What I'm going to do is I'm going to run um, a whole bunch of these tests. These first ones here, um, you see the first one here is just your standard one gigabyte heap uh, with no overcommit. That's our baseline. The second one, we've got a partially committed heap. Uh, and we've overcommitted that to 40%. So our 1.4 gigabyte VM is going to be forced to run in one gigabyte of memory. So that's our partially committed uh, run. Here we have this same as the first one, which is fully committed. Again, overcommitted this time, so baseline plus overcommit. Uh, the next one we're running with large pages. The next one we're using uh, concurrent mark sweep garbage collection algorithm. And the final one, we're actually going to use more live data. Okay, so we're actually going to force the heap to, uh, to, 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 to grow more. So these are our scenarios, and I'm going to run them through. We're going to have a look at what happens. Uh, and uh, then sort of analyze the results at the end. So what I need to do now is actually go into here, and I have, ta-da, fantastic. I'm so pleased that this is working. <laughs> Great. So this is the interface to my little uh, app. Now, very simple, right? You can just say, what is the size of the message? How many messages per second do you want to send? What is the delay on the receiver? Uh, what is the s total number of messages you want to send? And what is the size of the queue? And using all of those things, we can actually manipulate uh, the memory in a very, very simple way to create various different scenarios. And we use this very extensively in our, in our testing of, of, of the features that I do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this with a uh, predetermined uh, set of uh, values. So I'm going to kick all these off. And what's nice about this is that it actually tells you in real time exactly uh, what the garbage collection is doing, um, all sorts of interesting information. Apologies for the, uh, I should have automated this, really. So this last one, you see the message queue is uh, 8, 80,000, whereas in the others, uh, the message queue is 20,000, right? And then it just go goes down here. It tells us you know, what garbage collection is happening, all that kind of stuff. So it's just a, a really useful way to look at what's going on. So what I'm going to do actually now is go to this uh, second lot of VMs. Now, these VMs are exactly the same as the first six, 
but they're running the elastic memory technology that I've been developing over the last year and a half that I'm going to come on to talk about in a second. So we're going to run the exact same thing with that. And uh, again, if you'll bear with me for uh, two seconds <laughs> for each tab. Just kick all these off. Again, exactly the same scenario, different configurations, and then we'll move on, and then we'll come back to it, and we'll see exactly what's, what's gone on, what's happened. Cool. Right, excellent. That's all running. So let's go back to the presentation, and we will revisit this. Uh, we will revisit this later on. There we go. So overcommitting memory. So what I'm doing there is a classic example of overcommitting memory. I have a, a VM that's 1.4 gigabytes, and I'm forcing it to run in a memory that is just one gigabyte. Um, it's just a, a classic uh, case of overcommitment. Now, of course, there's costs, as I've mentioned before, to this memory reclamation, right? And the costs are, of course, relative to each other. The transparent page sharing I talked about uh, is very, very low cost, and that's why it happens all the time. Ballooning, actually, when it, when it works effectively, it's very efficient. You know, it can reclaim memory pretty quickly, uh, it's, it, and a lot of companies uh, rely on ballooning, actually, um, to, 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 to get efficient memory usage out of their hosts. A classic example of this, and in fact, I was talking to a company recently, right? They have the vSphere admins that hand out VMs to developers, and they say to a developer, how much memory do you want? The developer says, yeah, eight gig. Right? And then they run like a two gig process in there forever, right? And the buffer cache just fills up and fills up and fills up. And the VSR admins are able to overcommit that memory, steal some of that buffer cache back. The developer never notices. They have a warm and fuzzy feeling because they have their eight gigabyte VM. <laughs> but you know, you're not wasting all that memory on the host. I mean, that's a classic case where this kind of technology is, is used. Um, and we talked about swapping earlier on. Um, it's just important as well to distinguish between the swapping in the guest and swapping on the host. I know we've already talked about this, but it's worth making that distinction. Swapping within the guest is where the guest operating system is under too much memory pressure, and it pages uh, stuff out to disk. Swapping on the host uh, is where the host basically goes, this guy is using too much memory. It's violating the constraints that I've set for it. I'm now going to start swapping memory from it. So the guest operating system is not aware of that, um, but it will happen under the covers. Now, this slide, this possible workaround slide, was what I presented uh, at a conference before I'd finished this Elastic Memory for Java feature, but I think it's still really worth looking at because it's the result of everything that we sort of understood from all of the work we did before we actually developed the feature. So, possible workarounds to allowing, us, allowing safe overcommitment to Java. Well, as we've seen, the biggest problem with overcommitting Java is the lazy memory management, you know, where it just uh, creates a large footprint, maybe full of garbage, nothing can then get access to that memory. And actually, I bet, I wouldn't want a show of hands, but I bet there are people here who've worked at companies that just recycle JVMs every night for this very reason. You know, they just or reboot VMs or whatever. Yeah, some smiles and some nods. Yeah, it's like, oh, God. <laughs> um, so, tuning the Java heap so it collects garbage more proactively. Now, that is one way that you can get around it. As I mentioned earlier, Azul's JVM does this out of the box. It's very, very aggressive at shrinking its heap, but that has a very different approach to memory management. With, um, with the hotspot JVM, you can force it to do that by setting this max heap free ratio. The downside you have to that, though, is that you're incurring increased garbage collection costs all the time. Now, regardless of whether you're under memory pressure, you're always paying that cost when potentially you don't necessarily need to. Um, using a much more um, gentle, in inverted commas, garbage collection mechanism also uh, makes a big difference. Now, what do I mean by gentle? Well, the concurrent, uh, the concurrent collector in the hotspot JVM um, does garbage collection all the time. That's what concurrent means, right? It just kind of, it just sort of does bits of garbage collection all the time. Now, if the heap is swapped out to disk, and it's trying to read bits of that swap memory in over time quite gradually, the impact on the JVM's performance is not actually all that bad, because we're not hitting these latency bottlenecks of trying to stream masses of data in off the disk. 
but a classic concurrent, sorry, a classic mark sweep compact algorithm that's going to look at the heap and just go, just try and read every single object in it before deciding which ones to collect. That's the one that's going to cause the problems because reading in the entire heap, if the heap is swapped out, immediately you hit those bottlenecks and the latencies and the performance goes uh, down the toilet. So CMS, and again, I'm going to show you this in the demo, CMS performs a whole lot better if the heap gets swapped out. It may not be what you want for your application, but it's interesting to see the different behavior that it has. Um, you can, if you want to, set reservations on a VM. And basically, that says to the hypervisor, don't ever try and reclaim any more memory than this. Right? So if you have a scenario where you know that you have uh, a certain amount of buffer cache or a certain amount of memory that is safe to free, then you can do that, and that's one way to get around it. Yeah, that's actually a really good question. So the question was, when I'm talking about garbage collection, am I talking about the young generation garbage collection or the old generation? So this is a really interesting question because, um, I mean, not all garbage collectors are generational, but the majority of the ones that we're dealing with here, certainly in Hotspot, all of them, well, until G1 came along recently, they are, right? The young generation to the hypervisor just looks like a very hot area of memory, right? Memory's been copied, 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 copied. It's, it's just a very, very, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very consistent area of memory. The old generation has a very, very different profile, right? With a classic, uh, mark sweep compact algorithm, the old generation part of the heap, um, you know, you'll have memory being read, maybe there's a cache that's stored in there, maybe there's a whole bunch of garbage in there, but you know, there's not a lot of memory that's going to be read and written to in that old generation part of the heap. It's going to be much, much less active than the young generation part. What's interesting about that is when the hypervisor is looking at that VM and estimating how much memory is active in that VM, right, it's, it's quite hard for it to do because as soon as there's an old generation garbage collection, the, the JVM suddenly reads everything in from, from, you know, from, from memory, every single object, walks all the objects, figuring out which ones to mark and which ones to collect. It looks like a huge memory spike to the hypervisor because all of a sudden, all this memory has been read immediately. And so what it looks like to the hypervisor is, oh my goodness, this application has just suddenly just grown its memory by 2x, 3x, or whatever it is. And actually, it's not that at all. It's just a housekeeping operation. Right? But it, it, that kind of messes with some of these estimations as to how much memory is appropriate to reclaim as well. Right? And this, this, is, this is part of the problem we have with Java 2, is that the slightly eccentric way in which it manages memory leads, kind of fools the hypervisor to a certain extent in figuring out how much memory actually is really active at any one time. So to answer your question specifically, the problems occur with the old generation garbage collection because the, the, the operating system will never really page out the young generation part of the heap. It's just way, way too active. So that, just to clarify, yeah, that, that's actually a really, really important clarification. Um, so I was just talking finally there about reservations. The, um, the problem you have with the reservations is it's a static setting that will eventually probably end up screwing you, right? Because you'll set a reservation for a situation that you've got, and then someone changes the heap size, and who's going to remember to change that reservation? You know, it's, it's, it's one of those classic cases where when you have, when you apply static constraints to something that may be a dynamic, uh, you can end up causing yourself potential problems. So, uh, so I want to get on to talking a little bit about elastic memory for Java because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not that I'm <laughs> here to do a big marketing thing because quite honestly, you know, I don't care if you buy it, but it's just interesting because it's what I've, been, what I've been working on for the last year and it solves this very specific problem. So Elastic Memory for Java is a ballooning technology that balloons directly out of the JVM heap, right? So we're actually able to uh, target the memory reclamation in a VM that's predominantly running Java and put memory pressure where it actually needs to be, which is in the JVM heap. So when the balloon inflates, it causes a garbage collection or potentially causes a garbage collection that will cause the JVM to give memory back uh, to the hypervisor. And now, one of the design criteria we had with the M4J is that it shouldn't be uh, a custom GC policy, it shouldn't be a custom JVM, it's just a JVM TI agent that plugs into Hotspot and just works with whatever garbage collection policy you have, whatever heap configuration you have. It has heuristics that figures out what's going to be the appropriate uh, balloon uh, for that particular heap. So it just plugs into what you have and just does the right thing. So how does it work? Well. Remember our previous scenarios. We had um, the partially committed heap left in this state. Uh, remember, that was fine. We ballooned fine with that before. But if we use EM4J, 
and let's see what happens. Now, with the Info-J, the existing balloon is disabled, right? We, we, we haven't designed it to work with the other balloon because coordinating multiple ballooning technologies was beyond the scope of what we wanted to do. So what the Info-J will do is if it wants to try and uh, reclaim memory from the heap, it will write some data into the heap that uh, is just zeros, right? It's just zeroed memory. And then the operating system will look at that zeroed memory and it's fine, it just writes it into, 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 into its physical memory. But in the hypervisor, as soon as we've done that, we actually have a way of saying to the hypervisor, here's a block of zeroed memory, share this as fast as you can, right? And it can share that memory at 500 megabytes per second. So effectively what that does is it very quickly um, uh, reduces the amount of uh, memory on the hypervisor. And we'll do this again, right? Let's, the next one we're gonna write is gonna overwrite this blue memory and the hypervisor is going to do the memory sharing. So it's all pointing just to one single page on the hypervisor, which then has freed up that memory. Again, we'll do the same thing, and it's freed up memory. So really what it's doing is it's using a combination of the ballooning idea with some very aggressive page sharing just to free up memory on the hypervisor. Now, why didn't we pin memory in the heap? By the way, we didn't pin memory in the heap. So we don't pin memory in the heap because that would be a very bad idea because pinning memory in a JVM heap can cause horrible fragmentation problems and it's, uh, it's not something you want to do. So the nice thing about this is it's actually completely tolerant of compactions. So if there's a garbage collection, uh, we'll see in this one actually, if there's a garbage collection and the balloon data gets shifted around, uh, it's, it's, it's actually, that's not gonna have uh, any detrimental effect. So let's imagine that in this scenario we looked at before where we had problems, right, with a fully committed heap, let's inflate the balloon in that scenario. So we inflate the balloon, we add some more, uh, add some more, and event, let's say there's a garbage collection, right? So we collect some garbage, it's now gonna compact the balloon down, but that's fine, you know, that, that is, we're completely tolerant of that, and the net effect on the hypervisor is exactly the same as with, with regular ballooning. Now when the JVM shuts down, that zeroed memory is still written into the operating system, so it, the balloon doesn't necessarily Im immediately go away, right? It will go away once we've written over that memory, but that's, that's the technique that we've come up with to actually get the JVM to do the right thing. So what do we mean then by elastic? Well, let's have a look at a scenario where we have uh, two JVMs running in, in, let's say, two different VMs on the hypervisor. Let's say we put a load on one, and so we put a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, stuff in the heap. And let's say we put a load on the second one. Now the hypervisor now is actually getting a little bit low on memory. So it's like, okay, I need to reclaim some memory. Now it's gonna try and reclaim it from this guy because this guy is now the least active. Remember we talked about the active memory estimation. So it will balloon in the JVM heap. So what happens is we inflate the balloon. In other words, we actually allocate some objects in the heap that are just zeroed. We get the hypervisor to very rapidly page share that memory. And what's gonna happen now is the next allocation is gonna force a garbage collection, which it does. And then we're gonna balloon more in that heap. Eventually, we've actually filled the entire heap with the balloon here, which is not ne normally what you would necessarily do. But the effect is that it's handed all that memory back. So now, this guy is under load. This guy is actually now able to use all this memory. If the load switches back, what's gonna happen? Well the JVM should be perfectly able to write memory into the heap without us getting in the way, right? We shouldn't ever create an out of memory issue. So it's gonna to try to write some memory. It does a garbage collection which kicks the balloon out. It then writes some memory in there. And as it writes some memory, well, the hypervisor's getting low on memory again, so it's gonna balloon in this guy. So the net effect of this is that memory gets transferred between VMs in exactly the same way as it does with regular ballooning. The main difference is that we've man managed to find a way of targeting the ballooning at the right level in this, this whole equation, okay? So, before we look at this, uh, let's just have a look and see how our, how our demo is going along. Can someone just tell me the time? How are we, how are we doing for time? 7.25. 7.25, actually, that's, that's pretty good. Okay, so. I prefer to test software in front of people in a demo because if you're gonna find any bugs, this is where you'll find them. All right, well, that's fine. J Console's giving me a little problem, but that's fine. All right, let's go and have a look at the, the scenarios. Now let's just remind ourselves of 
what these scenarios are. In fact, what I'm going to do is just shift that up there just so that we can see it. So the baseline, let's look at the baseline first. What is the baseline? The baseline performance, uh, this is with a uh, fully committed heap, is that we've got one full GC, 91 minor GCs. The whole of the GC time has been basically three and a half seconds. Right? That, that's, that's the baseline run of what we'd expect to see. Bear in mind, this is a one gigabyte heap. So what's the next thing we're going to look at? Well, the next thing we're going to look at is a partially committed heap with overcommit. Right? So a partially committed heap with overcommit, which is the scenario we played out earlier. Let's have a look. That's not bad. Now, we've seen many more GCs, full GCs, which you would expect because the heap has grown and grown and grown and grown, like I showed you in the presentation. Right? Um, and naturally, Yes, has overcommit on, right? So we, the second scenario. That this is number two with overcommit on and uh, a partially committed heap. So what this is demonstrating is that even though we overcommitted this VM, it's actually performed pretty well. And the reason it performed pretty well is because the heap didn't actually grow to any like huge size and didn't actually then start conflicting with any ballooning, right? Because we use a partially committed heap. So all these GCs kept the heap size down. And okay, we spent six seconds total in GC time, but that's not, you know, that's not, that's not bad. So, number three, which is our baseline, which is the fully committed heap with overcommit. Let's have a look at what happened there. Okay, 53 seconds of garbage collection. Okay, one garbage collection took 41 seconds. Now, that's obviously a really big problem, right? Because a single garbage collection that takes 40 seconds is a time during which your, uh, your, your uh, server is completely unavailable. Well, at least, again, with, with, with the hotspot uh, garbage collection uh, stop the world that we're talking about, that's a, that's a serious problem. And with a one gigabyte heap, that's, that's a long garbage collection, right? Now, um, what's interesting is if we actually go and look at the VM stat output of, of these, right here, 21. So yeah, okay, so actually this is the one I want to look at is this one here. Now look at this, right? This is all the swapping that went on, right? So everything was fine, everything was fine, everything was fine. Suddenly it was like paging nightmare, right? And, and what happened, if you, I don't know, I mean some of you may not be familiar with looking at this format, but basically what happened here is a balloon inflated, paged massive amounts of the heap to disk, and, and the garbage collection um, exacerbated that, and that's why it turned into a mess. And with number two, again, this is actually quite interesting, right? With number two, you can see we've still got uh, 835 megabytes free. So that, that actually hardly used, that used very little memory at all. Um, number one, the fully committed heap, you see we only have 52 megabytes free. So the fully committed heaps left a much, much larger footprint, even though it's exactly the same scenario, right? So this is just illustrating everything we were talking about earlier. So let's look at number uh, four which is the large pages, right? So this is exactly the same as what we just looked at, except we're using large pages instead of small pages. Now, if we look at the VM stat output, you'll see there's no swapping there at all, right? Absolutely no swapping, and that's what I would expect to see, because we can't swap out large pages. We've got almost no mem free memory, but the hypervisor basically couldn't balloon, and so what we will see, if we actually go and look at this... Um, vSphere client here and go and look at this, this VM. Uh, what is it, 23? Yeah, it's 23. Yeah, actually, it's not actually that easy to see because it's in yellow. But there is, can, I, can you actually see that? Yeah, you can. That, that yellow spike is, is swapping, right? That's memory being swapped out. And so, let's go and have a look at what the uh, performance was of that. Sorry, I need to find where I, where I was. I've got too many windows here. Um, Performance of that, 191 seconds, right? So we had one garbage collection that took 150 seconds. So that's pretty much three-minute garbage collection, which is even worse than with the small pages, right? This is why we say don't overcommit memory with Java, <laughs> right? Because, because again, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's these incompatible models. So uh, let's look at how uh, concurrent mark sweep performed with this exact same scenario, right? So we have... Um, same overcommit, same heap configuration. And what we, now we can't directly compare garbage collection times of this because, because JMX doesn't report full garbage collections in quite the same way. But what we can look at is we can look at how long the thing took to complete. 
uh, which it should show us. Uh, where does it show us that? It shows us that uh, six minutes, 35 seconds, right? It took six minutes, 30, so that's an effective measurement of our throughput. So that took six minutes, 35. This one here took 10 minutes, 24, right? That's our bad case, that took 10 minutes, 24. Our best case took six minutes, 33. So actually, the throughput's pretty reasonable with, with CMS. And if we go and look at the VMstat output of this, this should bear it out. That's interesting. Why is that not? Hmm. OK, that's interesting. I would have expected to see some, some swapping on that one. I don't think that's misconfigured. OK, well, let's not worry too much about that. Um, so then on 25, uh, what I did is I increased the buffer size, four times the buffer size. We have much more live memory. But I had the scenario where we have the partially committed heap. So remember, with the part, number two, the partially committed heap, overcommitted, it worked fine. But it's because we had quite a low amount of live memory. But if we increase the amount of live memory in that scenario and go and look at this guy here, you see we've now got like 27 seconds of GC time. I mean, it's not awful. But again, it's, it's, it's starting to degrade pretty badly, right? So, um, and again, what that happened, again, let's look at this uh, here. Yeah, I mean, that, that happened because of this, right? It's not as severe as the swapping we saw previously, but it's still there. So now, <laughs> now uh, let's switch the exact same scenarios with uh, the Java ballooning and see, see what we have. Um, hopefully, it's all still running. I realized when I left the office that this is actually a, uh, an in, it's not a ship version. It's actually a development <laughs> version that I'm developing at the moment. So hopefully, it should all be good. OK, that's the last one. OK, so let's have a look at this first one. So this is our baseline again. The baseline, OK, well, this is, it's, it's, it's two seconds. Again, it's neither here nor there. This is, this is without any other commitment. That's, that's, that's our, our good performance. You know, but two, three, four seconds, it's all, all pretty much the same. Now, this is the um, fully committed heap. Is that the fully committed heap? No, that's the partially committed heap, I'm sorry. Um, thank you for, for reminding me of that. Uh, switch between there. The partially committed heap, you see we've got 10 garbage collections. Um, the GC time's pretty low. Everything's pretty happy. Everything's good. The fully committed heap was where we had big problems the last time around with the small pages. So fully committed heap here, you see we have two more garbage collections than we would expect because the ballooning's been pushing the garbage collector a little bit. But the total GC time's actually still pretty reasonable. It's still only seven seconds, right? Whereas before, it was 59 seconds. Now, the large page example. Now, EM4J works with large pages just as well as it works with small pages. Again, here we've got five seconds, right? Before, it was like 190 seconds uh, you know, when we were swapping. Uh, on this one, this is going to be the concurrent mark sweep algorithm. Um, again, we can really only look at the time it took, 6.35. It's a reasonable amount of time. Um, and then finally, this, this large amount of memory. Now, this is an interesting one. Now, here the garbage collection time has gone up uh, fairly significantly. It's, it's less than we got with the other scenario. Before, we got 27 seconds. With this, it's 18 seconds. The reason for this, though, is we forced this VM into a situation where the balloon and the live data are fighting with each other. right? And so the garbage collection time has gone up fairly, no, the garbage collection frequency has gone up fairly considerably because these two things are fighting. Now, in this scenario, we force that VM to be constantly overcommitted and, and, and make those two things fight. In, in, in a real world scenario, as soon as the live data starts to, to, to get big, the hypervisor brings the balloon target down, the balloon deflates, and the two don't end up fighting in this way. Right? But this at least shows what happens when you set the two against each other and they have to fight for the same space. So if we actually go and look um, in, in uh, the vSphere console, I mean, I don't know. There's not really a lot to see here, except that you know, all these VMs behaved as you would expect them to. The one thing that I will show you here um, is the VM stat output for all those em for j VMs. Um, as you would expect, there is no, uh, that's the baseline. Well, that, yeah, that's, there's no, no significant paging in that one. Um, again, no, I mean, this is what we would expect, right? We're not, there's, there's, no, there's no reason there should be any paging. That's why we got, you know, much better performance. 
anyway, that's, that's it. Ah, oh, it worked. <laughs> I'm really pleased with that. Um, so, thank you. <laughs> um, I don't... Um, it's, it's an ambitious demo, I have to say, because I tell you, I'm on a VPN to do all of this, and if the VPN goes, the whole thing is screwed, and that's what happened the last time around. Um, so, so what I'm hoping this illustrates, yeah, hi, question. So it's a good question. Um, so we put out a 1.0 of the Elastic Memory for Java uh, last September. Uh, as part of the vFabric product. Uh, it's embedded in uh, the TC server, which is Tomcat. Um, we're going to be increasing support for uh, other uh, application servers as we go forwards. Um, there's no reason why you couldn't just run it with any application server, except we want to make sure the logging integrates nicely, that the native library is in the right path, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it shipped last September, so this is, this is currently available in vFabric. So, I mean, when people ask me about um, like what this might be suitable for, it's not suitable for every scenario, right? In scenarios where a JVM is only a small percentage of the memory in a VM, this isn't going to work for you because you can only balloon out of the JVM heap. And if the JVM heap is really small, you're going to be very limited, right? But in cases where the JVM is consuming most of the memory in the VM or you've got a lot of JVMs, because this will work with more than one JVM, right? If you've got a lot of JVMs or one big JVM that's using up all the memory in your VM, and you've got varying workloads uh, on, on, a, on your host. An example, of course, is you know, different geographies, different spikes. You might have a batch thing that runs for a particular time. The nice thing about this thing is that the garbage collection happens at the most appropriate time, which is when the JVMs are idle. Right? When the JVMs are idle, the balloons inflate, it forces garbage collection, they clean up, they hand memory back. Okay. So that's, uh, that's kind of my product plug, as it were. Um, so let's get back to the presentation. Yeah. So this is actually a really good question. If the JVM balloon gets evicted, does it get a chance to come back, is the question. And the answer is yes, it does. Um, what we've had to do uh, in developing this is we have to basically say that the hypervisor is God. Right? If the hypervisor says to the JVM balloon, I need 500 megabytes, you know, we need to try and get 500 megabytes out of that heap as, as, as reasonably quickly as we can and give that back to the hypervisor. Now, inevitably, there's a cost to actually inflating the balloon because the balloon, we, what we, it's very, actually very, very trivial, right? We just allocate large byte arrays and they make their way through the heap and we zero them and we hand the memory back. Now, we've done an awful lot of tuning work to make sure that we use the right kind of references, um, you know, to make sure they don't get in the way. So, you know, we, we manage how hard the balloon is by managing a percentage of weak references and soft references and hard references, depending on the scenario, depending on how much memory pressure we want to exert, depending on how much we perceive the application is, you know, is, is pushing back, all of those things. So, um, but we've, we've spent a long time developing the heuristics to make it as transparent as we possibly can. The downside, of course, is that you know, given that we wanted this just to work with an existing JVM without modifying it in any way, this is really the only thing we could have done in order to make this work. You know, there's no other way of actually getting the heap to do what you want it to do. But it turns out it's actually surprisingly effective. Okay. So you say memory, resident memory. So yeah, these are these are just byte arrays that live in the heap, and they get moved around and they can get garbage collected, um, but Essentially, the, the, the balloon driver that, that works with the JVM is a, is, a, is a mutator just like anything else. And actually, what the balloon driver does when it inflates the balloon, in other words, allocates these objects in the heap to give memory back, um, we actually hide that from the, the, the main heap memory statistic with JMX so that, uh, so that any uh, monitoring tools don't look at this and go, oh my goodness, there's a massive memory leak. Right? You can switch that off, but again, we want to try to make that as transparent as possible. Um, so we've, we've, we've gone through, and actually, one of the things that I didn't show you, but I can show you here, uh, if I just find the right thing, is uh, I did start all these J consoles, and we never actually really looked at anything. Um, whoops. We have, um, let's get rid of that. We've put a whole bunch of, um, so that's the wrong one. There we go. We've put a whole bunch of mBeans in to help you see what's going on. So there's this, let me just maximize this. So there's this mBean here, and it will tell you, um, we've got, um, sorry, we've got 
balloon internal zenbean, right? So the balloon internal zenbean will tell, tell you exactly how much data is in there, right? It'll tell you the various reference types, how many bytes per second is being tenured, all that kind of stuff. We have um, the, st the, the state of the JVM balloon, so how big it is. Um, we've got the state of the balloon on the VM. We expose that as well. Currently, that's zero. Um, we also tell you, this is quite a useful MBean, we'll just tell you if everything's configured correctly, right? So we'll tell you, oh, OK, yes, you're on a compatible version of ESX. You know, you've got guest tools installed. Uh, so you know, we expose data to the server admin through a JMX uh, if you want to use that. Um, but um, I, I, let me get back to the presentation. And then at the very end, I'll show you a cool new tool we're working on where we're actually exposing Java stuff into the vSphere client, right? Because this is the first thing, this is my first sort of project, the first thing I really wanted to tackle and get right. Now that we've done that, yes, we're putting some improvements in, we're putting some new features in and whatever. But the next thing I want to really understand and look at is, is how do we give vSphere admins more insight into what's going on in VMs running Java, right? And we've, we've already come up with some really cool plugins into vConsole, sorry, vCenter, that give you really nice insight into what's going on in VMs running Java, uh, that help you to size them, help you to see how efficiently they're being used, all that kind of stuff. So at the end, I'll take you through a little demo of that, like a sneak peek of what we're doing there, because we haven't released that yet, but that's, that's coming real soon. Um, I'll just finish off the presentation. We can do some Q&A, and, and, and I think we'll, we'll be good. So one of the experiments we do, and this just shows you in a much larger context, we actually take a, a, a host uh, that has um, about 32 gig on it, and we run, uh, I don't know, something like 25, 30 of those VMs, uh, and we just round robin loads between them for about six hours. And this is kind of what it looks like on the host. Um, you can see that the memory overcommit is the difference between these two lines here. You see the ballooning here. There's a little bit of swapping that went on here. Um, but these two graphs show quite nicely the comparison between uh, a large page setup um, that I showed you on here, which is our worst case scenario, and the Java ballooning, which is our best case scenario. What I've done here is I've actually uh, taken the uh, 90th percentile average response time of a test case and loaded it from highest to lowest for all of these runs that we did round robining on all these servers, right? So it just gives us a distribution curve to show us you know, the, the worst to the best. And what this is showing, obviously, is that there are cases where, OK, we've got horrible performance, um, uh, a 90th percentile response time is like 10 seconds, and our average response time is like one second. And obviously, you know, some of them it performed fine. With the Java ballooning, this is our, 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 our curve. And this, by the way, is using uh, a whole combination of garbage collection policies, heap configurations, large pages, small pages, all the things that we've seen to try and get a, a you know, th this is basically the test that we do to test our algorithms, right? Just to make sure that we, we've got something that makes sense. And I know this is kind of a, you know, sort of, it's just one graph, right? And it's, you know, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's what we have for now. And in fact, I've just written a paper on this stuff that I presented in London last week um, that goes into more detail on what we did and how we did it and stuff. So if people are interested in that, I can, I can make that available. So we've, we've gone through the benefits. There's no need to go through this slide. Um, so I did put a slide in here about future topics, not that I'm like asking, <laughs> begging to be asked back or anything, but just something that's de definitely worth thinking about in terms of what we're looking at at VMware and, and, and where our priorities are with Java. Um, I talked about management and monitoring, right? That's, that turns out to be a big thing with customers, right? Particularly when you've got a vSphere admins and, and server administrators who do two different people. Right, the server administrator goes to vSphere admin and is saying, my server's performing like crap, why? Right? And, and when it's Java, there may be 100 different reasons why that is. Um, by making uh, a lot of the Java-specific information available to vCenter, which is what we're doing, we should give the, the vSphere admins much more uh, visibility into what's going on and, and really empower them to be able to say, OK, well, the reason this is performing like crap is because, because it's misconfigured in this particular way. So I'll show you that at the end for whoever wants to stick around and have a look at that. Um, another cool project that I encourage you to look at is this thing VI Java, right? And this has been around for quite a while. Um, it's, a, it's a way of actually um, having a Java API to allow you to manage and monitor um, uh, VMs, right? Now, the testing that I've talked about that we do, um, I have a... a um, um, a farm of about 40 VMs, right? And when I want to run a test on one of those VMs, I have an automated framework that boots the VM down, sets the amount of memory I want, sets the amount of overcommit I want, 
configures the operating system, configures the JVM, boots it back up again, starts the test, measures the response times, gets all the information that I need, writes it to CSV, and then shuts the thing down again, right? The things you can do with VMs and this VI Java API, particularly when it comes to testing, are really, really interesting, right? You can do absolutely anything you want and automate it. And I mean, I come from a test background, and that's really exciting to me. You know, the fact that I can just, just configure, uh, I mean, JUnit did this for Java, right? With JUnit, you can configure what you want, just run through a whole lot of tests, get the results at the end of it. But you've never been able to do that with with virtual machines, right? And with VI Java, you can do that. Although I think maybe in the future, a cool Spring project would be like Spring VI Java to make it a bit simpler, but anyway. <laughs> um, that's not any commitment, by the way, to anything. <laughs> Um, and finally, I mean, it would be interesting as well to look at, um, you know, the, the high availability story, the scaling story. You know, one of the things that VMware has kind of asked me to look at is, you know, how do we shout about vSphere and why vSphere is a great place to run Java, right? And, and you know, high availability, scalability, all those good things uh, all come into that. Spring Source, actually, despite being bought by VMware, is still very, very uh, active in innovating in, in, in cool new things. The Spring, the Spring Data Project uh, is, 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 is pretty recent, it's pretty cool. Anyway, enough stuff about what, what else is going on, but that's just interesting sort of stuff that you might want to look at and might be interested in uh, at some future date. So that is the end of my presentation. Oh, yeah, if you are interested in any of this stuff, I am Ben's Doings on Twitter. Um, I know it's, no, it, so I actually have two Twitter accounts. One is me, you know, sort of uh, on sort of drunken nights out going, ah, I love you. And the other one is work stuff, <laughs> right? That's my work stuff Twitter ID. Um, so anyway, um, finally, I, I promised you an appendix. The appendix, for the benefit of the video, just a summary of good uh, operating systems for the timekeeping thing we talked about earlier, how to configure large pages on Linux, a cheat sheet, and that's it. So, anyway, any questions? Oh, that's a really good question. So the question was, if we're scaling up, is it better to add more JVMs to a VM or add more VMs with a, with a JVM in? The reason that's a really interesting question is because there's commercial pressures to do it one way, and there's technical reasons why it's better to do it another way, right? Uh, you know, the commercial pressures of, okay, every operating system we're running is a fixed cost, so we want to load up our operating system with as many JVMs as we can. We see that a lot, and I completely understand that, right? Because every instance of an operating system, okay, you've got to patch it, and you've got to maintain it, and whatever. Uh, although there are ways we've developed to make that easier for you, that's still you know, something that, that, that is a consideration for people. There's the cost factor as well, you know, having a number of instances of Windows, whatever, you know, fill in the blank operating system. Um, the reason it's ideally best not to do that, um, particularly when it comes to memory management and overcommitting memory, is because remember I talked about how the hypervisor makes decisions based on active memory. Right? So if you load, and, and that's at the granularity of a single VM. So let's say you load two VMs with loads of JVMs. And some of those JVMs are active at some times, some of those JVMs are active at other times. The hypervisor is really not going to be able to make any sense of, you know, like, where do I reclaim memory from, right? Because both VMs are going to have a kind of a medium amount of activity that the hypervisor is seeing, right? The active memory is going to be sort of pretty, pretty much the same. Whereas if each of those JVMs were in their own VM, the hypervisor is able to make much better heuristic decisions as to where it reclaims memory from because, because it's doing that at the granularity of the VM. So that's, again, if you're not overcommitting memory, that's less of an issue. Um, and one of the things you'll see when I, when I just show you the, the, the monitoring management stuff, um, you know, typically in vCenter you have a host, you have, oh, you have a cluster, then a host, then VMs, you know, the kind of tree structure. Within a VM, you may have a number of JVMs, and we'll actually, you know, list the JVMs you've got running. We'll allow you to get visibility into, you know, each one, what, what's the garbage collection look like, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff, so. Okay, good question. How does the Java balloon communicate with the hypervisor? Um, each, uh, each guest operating system has a, uh, what we call a backdoor um, through which 
VMware guest tools can communicate with the hypervisor, the regular balloon driver can communicate with the hypervisor. It's a bit of magic, basically. It's just a magic communication channel uh, from the guest OS through to the hypervisor. And the hypervisor will say to the balloon driver, inflate to this particular size. And the balloon driver will pass back the page numbers, and the hypervisor just balloons the memory away. Uh, I do really appreciate you know, your uh, attentiveness and the questions were great. It's been a really good experience. Um, I hope it's been interesting to you. Do follow me on Twitter, as I say, and uh, I check out what we're up to. Uh, come work for VMware. There you go, <laughs> another plug. Um, actually, I get $2,000 a time if you come work for VMware, so definitely come work for VMware. Um, <laughs> and make sure you drop my name when you do.